Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. This is Bonnie from Hong Kong, and I'm the founding member of and executive director of Social Enterprise Research Academy, which was established in 2014 with a vision of harnessing the market to bring social caring through establishing a cross sectoral platform and together in it from different industries to foster sustainable development in Asian communities. We have united more than 10,000 business leaders, organizations, who are hosting international summits, but world class speakers, and our presence is extending to 13 cities. So today we're very dedicated to continual developments of social responsibility, and we're very happy that we can share one of the principles, which is to develop an inclusive community without discrimination. That is also one of the principles that is based on the UN Global Compact. And today's topic, diversity and impact investing, is a topic that is very close to the hearts of every working with female like myself. And I'm glad that Holossus has invited five influential leaders that experience in C suits and insights on impact investment with inclusive workforce management to be with us today to discuss on whether enforcing a random percentage of newcomers on board and C suits are welcomed, especially when investors around are asking to transform a male-dominated board to a much more inclusive board as well. So there is a quote saying that you know, if you are a chief executive officer and you don't have a gender diversity board, then that is a top as a top issue, then you must be have been a slip of the will. However, some listed companies that are hesitated at such proposals saying for appointments should be on merit instead of gender. So from this point, how can we ensure that we are having not only going diversity for diversity's sake, but also having the right skill mix and experience. And also some claim that there's a shortage of suitable candidates, and that is why there's a lack of women in board. And is this really the situation that I would like to ask the speakers as well? And how can we actually build up the right task force to cater the increasing demand, especially market demand, for female on the board? So um, today, uh, I will introduce our speaker one by one. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Mr. Tatsuki, Takasuki, who is actually a principal in Asia Operations from CBC Capital Partners in Japan. He is also in charge of a value creation of its portfolio companies, but served as a founder and representative director of Social Investment Partners, which is the largest venture philanthropy fund in Japan with a UM of 10 million. And I also, and he also teaches as a actions professor at Shisenkan University Graduate School of Leadership and Innovation. So I would like to invite Mr. Dasuki to tell us more about your view on, as, a, as from a PE perspective, on why investors are transforming from the historic male-dominated crops and systems, and on what perspective could investors drive a much gender balance board? And from your experience, what are the qualities that you think female leaders on board are commonly possessing? Please, please feel free to share. Thank you, Mr. Dasuki. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for the introduction. Do you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Here, here. yes. Great. So, you know, I've been in private equity for 20 years, and having worked for Carlyle and CBC for the past 20 years, and currently has been introduced as uh, a principal age operation team. So CBC has 160 billion U.S. asset under management as one of the largest private equity funds in the world. We have 24 offices around the world, and we were set up in 1981. And aside from that, I am a co-founder of Social Investment Partners, which is not-for-profit venture philanthropy fund. We have 10 million assets under management that uh, that's the largest venture philanthropy fund in Japan. So let me give you PE impact investment perspective as to diversity in three different stages. One is from portfolio company perspective. The second is private equity investment perspective. The third is what's next going forward. So in terms of first and portfolio company, I think the trend is very clear. 
we are seeing increasing number of female participation in in the highest ranks among our portfolio companies. And this is partially coming from IPA consideration. Um, I'm sure many of you know that, you know, uh, large bracket houses like Goldman Sachs have committed to not underwriting any IPO when a company does not have any female representation in the board. So we are seeing increasing uh, appointment of very senior female professional to the highest levels. And also we have large pool to select from. So if, from private equity investment perspective, we tend to have control over a very large organization worth in you know, 1 billion, 10 billion, in some cases. Therefore, as a shareholder, if you decide, uh, we can change the composition of very senior professionals. And we are very aware of the pressure of, of limited partners. Those are, tend to be very large institutional investors in the world. Therefore, I, I, I see you know, a continued trend of increased female representation of companies owned by private equity. And there is no reason for us to believe this trend will not continue. So my, my personal view is we're going to see, we, we are likely to see the increasing trend of this. Then if we look at private equity uh, houses, so I'm talking about the you know, largest funds like KKR, Blackstone, Carlyle, CVC, we are heading to a similar direction as to our portfolio company. So we are seeing increasing, increasing number of very senior female professionals. However, the pace is slower and number is also slower and seniority is limited compared with those of uh, our portfolio companies. And to start a little bit of analysis, th this is a fact which is the return in private equity is driven by, most largely by the deal leader. It's not by deal, it's not by fund, it's not by firm, it's actually by an individual deal leader. So McKinsey and Bain each conducted analysis on this one, and this has been confirmed. So this is in a very individual driven performance world, if you will. And then uh, Carlyle conducted a fairly extensive survey of different deal leader capabilities and performance within Carlyle's network. That was about six, seven years ago. And it was very clear, uh, female leaders tend to perform better than the male leaders. So if we combine those two facts, one, it's deal leader driven, Two, a female leader te leaders tend to outperform male leaders. The natural selection for a firm like you know, Carlyle and CVC are to try to increase the female representation in the deal leader world. So the intention is there. Then if you look at the fact base, uh, you know, the, the pace of advancement has been limited. So for functions like HR, investor relations, uh, for those functions we do see you know, fairly significant female representation. However, if we turn our eyes into investment world, in other words, the leaders, we still see very limited uh, participation of female leaders. So we do need to accelerate uh, our efforts to increase those. So that's, you know, private equity perspective. Then the last, my last comment regarding what's next. I do think that it's very likely for private equity houses to see significant female representation, representation in the highest levels going forward. And we are seeing you know, significant number of increase of mid-class mid female professionals within the deal deed. So in three to five year time frame, they will be a perfect candidate for you know, uh, the deal, very senior deal lead or even fund heads. And our limited partners are fully supportive of this. And we do have to report our diversity performance to the limited partners. So those trends combined, I'm, uh, I remain very optimistic as to you know, what next in terms of female representation. Let me pause here for any questions or hand over to other panelists. You're on mute. Yes, thank you. So thank you, Mr. Lesuki, for sharing. And I invite Mr. Mark Larson. 
Um, Simone Mark is actually the executive chairman from Lights Capital in USA. So Mr. Carismo is an executive trustee of the University of California at Davis Foundation. And he served as the vice chair of the finance committee and also serving the course of Light Tech Capital, Ava Bank, Colin BC, Customer Vanyards, and Galanti Finance Investors. And prior to these positions, he had been 27 years of experience in the banking industry and spent the last 24 years at the Silicon Valley Bank that served various positions, such as interim CFO for twice and overseeing the international expansion. So, ran the lending commission and he retired from the bank as the chief risk officer, overseeing credit risk management, risk uh, credit review, and also he's a um, BS from the University of California Davis and also an MBA uh, from the Harvard, University, the Harvard Business School. So, it would be very crazy. If Mr. Marissa, you could share with us some of your views uh, from um, ESG perspective and how do you think uh, investors could balance fiduciary duties on returns with ESG and diversity and the inclusion goals. Um, I think um, from maybe from the risk perspective, risk management perspective, you can also tell us more and how do you think you can implement effective policy based on this mission. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I have sort of, you know, three perspectives. One perspective is having worked for a company that was uh, focused on um, equity um, diversity. Um, and the issue is, you know, I retired about five years ago, but I would say probably the last five, five years I was at the company, we thought about it a lot, and that was Oakland Valley Bank. And what we found is we were finding an attrition of, of female leaders at the more senior ranks. And I think part of the problem was, was the way we defined the job. And the job was very demanding. Um, as you went up the ladder, there was more nights expected, going to functions, et cetera. And we found that that was a barrier to a fair number of our high-performing females that they cannot be out of the house, you know, that many nights a week. So it's a, I know it's a problem that they're they're still grappling with as to how they do it. Then I've got, since retiring, I now sit on five boards. Um, two of those boards are led by women, women CEOs on the board. Um, two of the other companies, the number two person and CFO are women. Um, and so there's a real sensitivity to this issue, Um Going forward, and then lastly, I sit on the uh, UC Davis Endowment Executive Trustee, and we just finished, you know, this past year redoing our um, ESG social equity diversity policy, um, and it sparked quite a lot of discussion with us as to how we do it, how we measure ourselves, and how we go forward. Um, and since we have moved to the UC Regents. Um, as our CIO, um, we've had a lot of discussions with them as to how they're approach, approaching it. Um, and clearly they have, you know, similar pressures and what they see as opportunities as we do. So we're pretty, pretty simpatico. And what we decided to do is not put in hard, hard uh, goals right this moment um, and have it be more, here's directionally where we want you to do. One, we expect our CEO to look for, you know, diverse uh, applicants when it's looking at funds and managers of those funds. Um, and we, we expect them to keep moving in a positive direction, bringing more diversity into there. And certainly the, the regents, you know, is pretty public about what they want to do. So we will we'll review that on an annual basis. On the company side, I would say, you know, the problem is trying to find, the right people, even at the board level, because one of the companies I deal with wants to go public. And clearly there's, there's requirements in the state of California, NASDAQ coming where we have to have diversity, both gender and also underrepresented groups and also um, sexual orientation too. So we have to look at those three boxes and, and put together a, a board that meets, meet the requirements. And for us, it's trying to find the right 
uh, candidate and the most qualified candidate for it. And it, um, it's not easy. And that's the reason why we're starting very early. We're not public yet, but we're going to be public. But we're starting now saying that we may be public in 18 months, two years, but we need to be looking for those people, uh, people now. And as far as internally the companies, it's what, what are our job requirements? What are we expecting of people? How do we mentor um, both? And for us, it's both gender, underrepresented groups. It's the whole piece. We put it into one, one bucket. You know, how do we mentor these people up into the organization so that we don't, we don't lose them? Because clearly everybody's looking for these types of people, and it's a very competitive marketplace out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mr. Mark, uh, for sharing. Indeed, it's very competitive out there. And yes, may I invite the first speaker to share, Ms. Natalia, uh, who is actually the co-founder of Water Ventures in USA. So, Ms. Natalia is an unconventional and out of box finger and competence in the green food formation of fund management companies. And are creating networks to build investment pipelines and portfolio companies and contribute to the data for site. So I know that um, today uh, she's going to share on some key points that she would like to make her issues that uh, she's more sensitive about, such as advancement of really large, high growth potential startups and the connection with the resources they need, and such as coaching, networking, financing. And how impact investing could solve issues of the city's caused by global climate and demographic changes, especially the impact for women and contributions as our innovation adopters and change advocates. And also on impact measurements of range of unserved and underserved people and planet. The BC funds that also on the BC funds performance increase driven by diversity. And she would give us some practical examples or statistics, statistics to uh, illustrate how PC fund performance is actually being increased by the, having more diversity. So, hi, um, is Natalia. If you are and see, yeah, please feel free to share with us your views. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope my connection and you can now hear me well. Yes, I Thank you. I release the opportunity how to transfer the historically made diverse, inclusive boards and CCs. Fully joining the executive promote novel strategies and on R&D innovations with overcome their political and social COVID-19. So I started in just on IT and supply chain. Yes. The venture capital industry. I can't I think the connection has some issue. The connection has some issues from your side. It keeps uh going on and off and we cannot hear your sharing. I yes. Okay, maybe you, I pass Yes, um yes, we can we can try to pass to another speaker and then we can go back to you, okay? See if you can resolve your issue and then uh we can you can try to resolve the issue by uh as by, by time, yes. So the next speaker we'd like to invite her is Prince Sandy Martins Ayajo. Um, Prince Sandy is Vice President of Bio Drive to Energy and Chairman of the global company. And he was born in a royal family in El Fefe, Nigeria. Um, and he's a former football professional and an actor. So with his actor role, in the film in James Bond, Quantum of Solar. So I would like to know more about that as well. So, and our com and his, he mentioned that his company transformed with developer resources, such as electricity, cement, and 
and he provides shelters and jobs for many people. And also, he has already met at least nine of the UN um, global health SDGs goals, sustainable development goals. And uh, he, his education background is mainly in engineering and sports management. So, yeah, I would like to invite Mr. Sandy you to share more on how, um, why you think that investment is important and what is the global impact of it and the effect of it on it and what you what do you think about women's role in modern days and especially one of the advantages and challenges please feel free to share with us thank you mr Sonti. we cannot hear you at the moment mrs Sonti. yes i think that the speaker has an issue about the speaker your mic has some issues, so we cannot hear. All right. No, we cannot hear. I, I, I re we realize that um, the issue. So, okay, again, uh, maybe Mrs. Needs, just feel free to to check on your your mic at the moment, and that we could uh, come back later. Again, we we, we understand that uh, there's an instability on the on the on the Wi-Fi as far as on the the speaker mic. So, um, so the first speaker I want to introduce is Mr. Uh, Mr. Ralston Fluid, um, who is actually president of CSPLC from Switzerland, um, which is a United Nations accredited NGO focused on self sustaining solutions. So, he is an electric PMF, uh, uh, who is actually a scientist and engineer a technologist, a business manager, a psychologist, and a management specialist. And he is a member of the American Psychological um, Association, a fellow of the World Society of Medicine as well. And he managed large uh, MNCs and also with an ex expertise in supply chains. So today, um, he's also a thought leader and a futurist and an advocate of women empowerment. And he is also a social entrepreneur. Um, he he actually has been a social entrepreneur, is a West Dialogue actor, which is based on the adoption of the whole family in Hong Kong. So, yeah, I think um, today we we could invite you to share your views on female leadership and what women could, what women uh, bring and what challenges women are facing at workplace. And uh, I understand that Mr. Fluid would like us to. Do a sharing screen on the on the on slide. Okay, let me share. So, thank you. Okay, so please feel free to share, Mr. Flint. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, um, firstly, I think I perhaps should say that we are only beginning to realise the full power and impact of women leadership. Um, obviously, the gender lens, academic research, government policy, their role is, is now being celebrated, whereas I think uh, there was a lot of confusion and diversity and impact investing, is they are now critical. Uh, I, I come f also from an old family. We've been around for a long time. And one of our family colleagues uh, has, is a woman who has uh, more than 300 billion to invest. Uh, so the, the world is changing and that's just the interest on the account. So my personal reflections are very much that COVID has forced many changes. Um, we saw this during the various wars that women had a, a new role. They replaced men in many of the uh, operations. But then I thought it was helpful to perhaps look in a more focused way of what women leaders bring. So I think the first thing they, they do is they challenge mindsets. Uh, we have historically been a process and task culture and we need to go to participation, trust and flexibility. I mean, we see a world which is changing so fast that you can no longer manage it by rules that have been historically 
aspects of the grassroots and at the customer level. And that is where women are often with participation and trust are very effective. We also need women are also be good at celebrating positive. Uh, I believe personally that we need to move towards harmony and balance because it is only through finding and that we uh, will find solutions, particularly across cultures and across diversity. And women are very important at playing the long term game. Um, and much more able to manage uncertainty with agility. If you think of the just bringing up a family and uh, all the challenges of that, uh, um, I mean, very effective bringing up the family and corporation. Okay. Uh, I think there's some signal issue over, over there, and uh, this document uh, presentation has has been interrupted uh, by the unstable. Could you actually speak up a bit? Um, can can you hear us? Okay, we cannot hear you still. So unfortunately, we cannot still hear you. Uh, let's see if <laughs> let's see if um, the other speakers like we could actually have a really brief discussion based on what we have discussed and mentioned just now uh, in in order to uh, to. to to have the remaining time to have a fruitful discussion. Skills, you know, as the poly natural polymaths. Um, Hello. And again, this is Hello. this is needed. Well, welcome back. Welcome back. Yes. Hello, welcome back. We've this is needed in all now. Okay. Well, I was I was just saying that women provide flexible working, working from home and working from the office, and that's something we've learned from COVID. We need the relationships oh. between people there's a sort of like a hive mentality in terms of families um, they are more effective at managing in micro clusters and that's very much the survival ethos um, they're eclectic polymaths and I think they have a passion for ethical investments so ESG is a natural uh, place for women and very much around lifelong learning and hybrids because Women, as they move through roles in organisations, will actually um, help each other. And I think we have to be conscious of the biological windows for women. I mean, we have the childbearing years, we have you know menopause later on, and we have menstruation, which can actually create challenges. Now we need to accept that that's that's what's happening. Yes. Um, so I think we move to we need to move from money first. To a multi-layered value proposition of wellness, wellness for the people and wellness for the organisation. We're in Japan, has a joy and fun as his business model, and when his factories were destroyed due to a tsunami, the employees rebuilt them in three months. Joy and fun is crucial. Um, there needs to be a moral compass uh, across all generations, and I think if you and mission and so on, it's very important to consider. We're beginning to discover that grandmothers are incredibly important in societal change, 
So if you look at the grandmothers in businesses to mentor young women, I think that could be worth considering. Environmental responsibility is a natural uh, requirement for where we live now. Uh, engagement from engagement to creation, in fact, sharing the dream is, is critical. And then as we move from centralized to self-assembling dynamic networks, if you operate on the edge of the Chinese symbol for which is the combination of danger and opportunity. And I think women are very good at managing danger and also extremely good at managing opportunity. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Flute, for your sharing. And even though there's some disruption on the signals, um, uh, certain points are uh, actually missed out, but um, glad that uh, actually you have a slide and then we can um, clearly see your points and follow on the on your uh, flow. So yeah, I can see that. Natalia, you're back. Can you speak up a bit? Yes. Can you try to do your sharing and see if the signal is stable or not? Hello again. Can you hear me well now? Yes, yes, definitely. So, sorry, sorry for the bad connection. Uh, don't know what the reason was, but let me let me start again then. Yeah, sure. Please let us know your views on like how 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 women could actually um, get connected, you know, with with your with the resources they need. Yeah. Thank you. So, as, as I said, I released the opportunity to discuss how to transfer to the more diverse, inclusive, and gender equal boards and C suits. And uh, women will promote novel value creation strategies, catalyze focus on R&D, balance innovations with risk mitigations to overcome the economic, political, and social disruptions caused by COVID. So, I started in corporate roles. And... Um, I worked worldwide in uh, supply chain and operations. And then I transitioned to the venture capital industry six years ago. I currently work in a senior management role in a venture capital firm, and I'm building the pipeline and investing in early stage deals. And I manage portfolio, including uh, women-led startups and provide additional services in addition to funding. And I'm serving as a board member in startups. So many times in the meetings with other VCs and LPs and startups, I find myself being the only woman in the room still since 2015. I'm sure you know Prechin, uh, the foremost provider of data, analytics, insights to the alternative asset community. They published their first report on women in alternative assets in 2017, starting to provide the transparency to the industry about the diversity and uh, gender balance. That time, uh, the presentation of women in the alternative industries was <laughs> as whole well, uh, 18.8%. And uh, it fluctuated to 20.5% in venture capital. So I was on the uh, good side of the alternative assets industry. I mentioned that I work in senior positions. So that time in 2017, there were only eight women in, uh, eight, eight percent of women in senior positions in investment teams and 10% in portfolio management teams. And I do both, and I know how it feels, and I know how we as women can influence the decision making and the discussions and uh, give the 360 perspectives uh, and show different passes and uh, different ways to enter the markets and to work with the target uh, audiences of the startups and the uh, target audiences of the mid-sized companies. So at board level, 
uh, in alternative uh, assets. Women are highly underrepresented. It was 6% in 2017. Uh, it uh, has not grown much since that. It's still on the 6.6%, I guess, in 2021. And it is very discouraging. And uh, the reason why it happens, uh, I think, lies in the lack of initiative coming from the LP side, demanding more female board members, and also from uh, the startup side, because they are not uh, requesting as a, as the clients of the uh, venture capital industry, they are not requesting more women on board um, in, in the VCs and uh, also more women in uh, senior management teams. We co-founded Brighter Ventures with uh, my alumni from Triumph Global Executive MBA. And uh, we did it uh, with a mission to advance women-led entrepreneurship and connect women uh, led high growth potential startups with the resources they need, like coaching and training, tra and training. Uh, also to advocate for women-led entrepreneurship by providing thought leadership and uh, to showcase the startups through the global women startup competition. And we think that in combination with uh, the active request from the LP side, and uh, the efforts on the corporations, uh, on the corporate boards and uh, corporate leadership team to encourage more women to try th themselves as VCs, uh, as advisors, uh, as mentors, as coaches, as uh, the startups, as startup team members, intra or entrepreneurial. Uh, and with this uh, active support uh, of the nonprofits like our Bright Adventures, uh, there can be uh, the better representation of women in the boards and in the senior uh, management team can be achieved uh, by 2025 and 2030. But our topic is not only uh, diversity, but also impact investing. And the question is, uh, how is it related, impact investing and diversity and advancement of entrepreneurship? In my case, I'm focused on impact investing uh, for the cities. Uh, that's, uh, that's my point of interest uh, for the next few years. And I think that women can help a lot to the impact investors. First of all, what is impact investing? Uh, impact investing refers to the investments made with a specific intent of generating positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside financial return. And we know that when we invest to women, we not only invest to them as entrepreneurs, we invest to the community because women expand uh, their ideas, their services, the benefits they are creating, the extra value they are creating to their families, to the community, and to the broader society. Uh, I presume that uh, with uh, the climate change and the problems caused by climate change for the cities and uh, with the demographic changes uh, happening in the developed and developing countries, there is a huge role for entrepreneurs uh, who can not only create the financial returns, returns to the investors, but also solve uh, the problems and address the needs of unrepresented and, un and underrepresented uh, groups in the society and also address the problems of the planet so that they, they as entrepreneurs, care about the long-term effect, long-term positive effect and impact. And I think it's especially important for Asia, uh, where uh, the population is growing uh, at accelerated pace and uh, where the most populated and fast growing cities and technologically advanced cities are currently located. So the question is, 
will women be able to accept the responsibilities to drive technological innovations to get more involved and also to take the role of being the advocates the change agents of impact investors and i think the question is not only will, will they be willing to accept but also will they be able to accept with will governments corporations private employees and investors create an enabling environment provide infrastructure and support what COVID showed to us it showed that low investments in the women-led businesses and startups uh, their traditional workplace constraints lack of child care unpaid caregiving challenges as a formidable obstacle so we need uh, governments and corporations and employers and investors to address those problems and help us to enable more women entrepreneurs uh, creating impact for the planet in the next five to ten years yes. Yes. thank you thank you can i uh, invite uh Prince can you speak or is the mic still not available okay i can see that the mic is still not really working on your side so yes and well understood so um so i understand mr sunday's um, expertise is actually on water treatment and engineering and sport management and he he mainly has been intelligently handling this water waste management so as well as he mentioned to me during yesterday rehearsal that he has a team that has consisted of female um, workers and has been trying to improve the expertise of his female workers as well so um, even though today um, I understand that your mic is not working really well but then, uh, yeah uh, we understand that um, he has been really uh, supporting uh, women role and uh, appreciating the advantages in today's modern firm as well so thank you um, we understand that we still have three minutes so uh, let's see if we can have some questions from the from the audiences. So I can see that uh, Prati, uh, you're here. Hello, and Dr. Martha, and also Mr. Yushitaka. Hello. Uh, do you have any questions for our speakers? And see if we can uh, answer it. I think we can accept one or two questions if it's quick one. See if you have any questions. Uh, okay, if any, or if our speaker has any uh, things I'd like to add on for the last two minutes, please feel free to speak up to add on to or response to each other's uh, point of views, etc. I have a question. How sure. many female board members uh, all the participants plan to hire to their boards in 2022 in the companies in their portfolios um, your question is for which speaker uh, for all the participants uh, ah, who would like it. No, i can address that i have three portfolio companies now and mm -hmm. my plan is to increase women participation to at least 25 percent in 2025 Therefore, yeah, 25. If, because, you know, as we have discussed, there is a qualification challenge that is imminent. Therefore, for 2024, uh, my guess is like between uh, 15 to 20%. The number will be dependent on the size of the board. So it could be like 2% or 4%, depending on the company. So that's my answer. Thank you. Sure. I'm happy to help with coaching. It's uh, help. The qualifications improvement. Yeah, I guess if I look at my companies, the company is going to go public. We'll add um, at least one new board member, which will be um, a, di a, a diversity um, hire, whether it's gender and or underrepresented group, etc. So we have to do that, maybe two, depending on how close we think um, the IPO is, what the markets look like. Uh, the one one company, the you know the 
the female CEO owns 50% of the company. So I'm at her whim as to whether or not she wants to add any board members. Um, but she has certainly a controlling interest and can do what she wants to do. Um, the other three right now are, and again, another one is female led. Um, they are um, kind of holding steady right now. And it's just that, you know, they feel their board size is kind of appropriate and none of them have public plans at this point. So they have a little more flexibility as to, um, as to what, what they do. Um, but all of them have, um, except one, all of them have um, a female, at least one female board member. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So today's session is about to end, and I'd like to thank everyone for the sharing. And I wish we could see more female on board in the coming time. And thank you very much for your answers and also your questions. So let's say goodbye and see you again next time on Gorasis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moni, for my challenging connection issues. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The world is very really really sorry for, for, for Mr. Sony's connection. So, really hope that we can uh, be sharing again next time. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Moni, for my all the best. Thank you.